you um, rotating through the CCU or consult services. Um, the whole idea of acute aortic syndromes may be a little bit foreign to you. Um, you know, typically you just think of aortic disease, aneurysm, or is it a dissection? Uh, but I wanted to go over it a little bit more in depth with you, sort of to recognize these things, certainly because they're life-threatening, and uh, there's some been, been some advances in the management. So after the talk, you should be able to define uh, what an acute aortic syndrome is. Mike, do you know how to turn on this microphone? No, the Tegrity one looked like it was working, but the uh, this one's not. All right, we'll keep trying to work on the mic, but um, also at the end, just be able to talk about risk factors for dissection, rupture of, of the aorta, the different types of imaging modalities and where are the limits for each of those types, and then what, what's the uh, starting therapy when you have an acute uh, aortic syndrome. So the bottom line is it has something to do with pathophysiology of the aortic wall, the structure and the function, and that can uh, obviously threaten pressure if you exsanguinate, you're going to have zero pressure um, and, and could be dissecting and cutting off blood flow to the heart, to other organs, the kidneys, the gut, etc., the brain, and obviously survival is at risk. So when we think about acute aortic syndromes, it's not just a section. There's something called the intramural hematoma and the penetrating aortic ulcer. How many of you have seen this? Either the left. Okay, they do exist, so it's, it's helpful to raise awareness, especially with our, with our imaging modalities now we can see these. Um, obviously, you can have trauma and a, and a rupture from that. <clears throat> so a dissection is actually a tear between, uh, between the intima and the media in the aorta. It's not an aneurysm. Some people will say dissecting aneurysm. Sometimes it happens in the setting of an aneurysm. It's actually tear. It's dissecting between the tissue plane, the intima and the media of the aorta. <clears throat> you can have it in other vessels, but this is obviously an aortic dissection. Intramural hematoma is you can't necessarily see the tear, whether it's a TEE or a CT, but you see a big collection of blood in the wall. So it, it could have been that there was a dissection um, and it sealed off and you have this now intramural hematoma, or it may have come from the outside, such as the vasa vasorum. Uh, penetrating aortic ulcer is this sort of out pouching. There's a neck on it, and you'll see it on, especially on CT or MRI. Um, sometimes when people have a rapidly expanding aortic aneurysm, they can have chest pain from that. And then certainly there's aortic rupture, which uh, typically would be more associated with trauma. Could be associated with a chronic aortic aneurysm as well. You guys, I'm sure, know this about aortic dissection. You know, we have these different classification schemes. But basically, we, we make them into type A as the standard one. Uh, type A is the ascending aorta. Type B is it's not. It has it's past the left, left subclavian. <clears throat> Some, if someone has something that's just localized to the arch, it kind of gets turned into A or B depending is it going down or is it going, you know, is it towards the ascending aorta or is it going down the descending to make it sort of an A or a B. This is just a schematic of that where uh, the old DeBakey type 1, 2, 3, basically this is A, uh, this, this one is A and B, this is the whole shebang, but A is ascending aorta, D is the descending, and, the, and it's after the left subclavian. And that's important just because of the management uh, differs. You should know that sometimes people have a chronic aortic dissection where they present after a few weeks. So normally we think of aortic dissection, we're thinking time. It's not time as muscle, but your mortality goes up um, by the hour when you have an acute aortic dissection. It's about 1% per hour. So it's, a, it's an emergency. You want to get people aware and decide about surgery or not uh, if you have a proximal aortic dissection. Um, but when people have had it, they've kind of, the natural history, they've obviously survived something that could have killed them. So their, their prognosis is a little bit better. Um, but that's called a chronic dissection. That's defined by somebody who's had it for more than two weeks. I've seen this a few times. One of them was here. I don't know who, if any of you were involved in this case. It was a prisoner who was just released. He's only 38. And he came in for a Tegretol medication issue. And he had a really loud murmur of aortic insufficiency. 
Dr. Casper asked for an echo on a Sunday, and uh, you could see how nervous she was. So she said, I don't know if this guy's going to follow up either. So anyway, we did the echo just on the transfer. Asked if you could see a dissection flap from his ascending all the way down to his iliac. And um, mm -hmm. it turns out he said a few months or a few weeks earlier he had had chest pain in jail, and they gave him Maylock. And so that probably was not very good. Um, so looking at uh, dissection, we know um, there's a this thing called the International Registry of Aortic Dissection, which looked at what are the typical symptoms, who are the typical patients, what kind of risk factors do they have. So we think that the incidence of aortic aneurysm dissection is about 16 uh, per 100,000 for men and 9 out of 100,000 for women. Women are particularly at risk. Obviously, hypertension and cocaine doesn't help you or having Marfan syndrome, but um, pregnancy is another risk factor for dissection. You can have coronary and aortic dissections during pregnancy. Um, the average age is about 63. Um, Marfan syndrome is about 1 out of 5,000, but they obviously have a higher incidence of aortic dissection. Um, intramural hematomas are about 13% of all the acute aortic syndromes, and that may be that they were dissections that kind of walled off. Um, occasionally, you can get a rupture when you have an aortic dissection. Typically, that would be with type A. But mo again, most of them are with trauma in the acute setting or a rupture of a chronic aneurysm. In fact, a lot of the fatalities, I don't know if you guys remember the comedian Sam Kinison. He screamed like crazy. If you haven't ever seen him, I can't endorse him because he curses like a bad man, but it's hilarious. Um, anyway, he got in a car accident, was hit really hard from behind, got out of the car, was talking to the person, and then went down. This is what happened to him. Right where the ligamentum arteriosum inserts on the aorta. It sort of anchors the aorta so that sheer stress can just rip the aorta and people die pretty suddenly. So obviously there's risk factors for these syndromes. Genetically, it would be Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. They're familiar thora familial thoracic uh, aneurysms. Bicuspid aortic valves also get cystic medial necrosis uh, in the aorta and get aneurysms. Um, coarctation, Turner syndrome, is associated with coarctation, so is Newman. Um, the other acquired ones that we see more commonly are hypertension, uh, someone getting cardiac surgery where they clamp the aorta could be a risk factor later. If you've got a cardiac cath, you're running a catheter along the lining, you could have dissected the aorta. Again, pregnancy, um, it's pretty uncommon, but if you're under age 50, that's one of the more common reasons. Um, and then inflammatory things, Takayasu's, giant cell arthritis. Ironically, syphilis does not cause it. We don't see a lot of advanced syphilis with this, these giant aortas anymore. But that typically, even though they get these very large aortas, they don't get it. But cocaine is another one that can cause it. So this just tells you about size and the risk of rupture. So if you're looking at a chronic aortic aneurysm, you know, we talk about when to change things. You can see, at least, you know, these are usually small studies. Um, but basically, when they're over six, the risk goes up for having complications. So that's why we're trying to repair people here. And if you have Marfan syndrome or other genetic abnormalities, we may, we'll may we recommend actually replacing the root at, at five centimeters instead of five thousand. Again, a dissection is, a, is literally a dissection between the tissue planes of the intima and the media. Um, <coughs> I think I told you most of this. You, I told you you can have a tear. You, you, we normally can see, even with the echo, we can often find the tear, especially with the TEE. You could put Doppler there, and you can see the entry and exit sites. Um, some people have, you know, you sort of look for those, and if they were going to stent it, they try to wall that off just to stop that communication of blood flow between the true and the false lumen. Um, there's a very common location in the proximal aorta. It's typically in this lateral wall. And sometimes people will come in, and what happens is it's in the proximal aorta, and it dissects down into the right corner, because that's often where it happens. So someone may even present with an inferior stemming. They go in the cath lab, you can't get the catheter in, and then they shoot the aorta and realize there's a dissection flap, and it runs all the way down into the right corner. So you send that patient to surgery, get the aorta fixed, and bypass that right corner either. <coughs> <clears throat> for people who have clotted off this false lumen and completely they have a little lower risk of future complications, especially in type B. For people where it's not completely clotted off on imaging, it did pre predict future events. And it's unclear, this is an observational study, is it there's ongoing pressure in there, there's ongoing flow, there's something else 
that's going on. All right. So there's something else that's going on. So when it does clot off, a little better prognosis. Obviously, they had a dissection and it was a problem, but it's a little lower risk of having future problems as opposed to someone who's partially clotted off because for whatever reason, there may be ongoing pressure that they can get further aneurysmal dilatation, another dissection, or rupture. So it's, I'm, I like imaging, and imaging is, is helpful pictures, words, a thousand words. So <clears throat> this is obviously a, um, an axial view in the CT scan. Here's the arch going into the descending aorta. And you can see how thick the wall is. This is an intramural hematoma. And obviously we don't see anything staining here where the dye is going in. It's unclear, is this a dissection that walled off and you don't see the entry sites anymore? Or is this actually hemorrhage in the vasoviorum around the aorta? And, and no one really knows for sure. Uh, but this, this can cause you very similar symptoms to an aortic rupture or dissection. Typically, when you make that diagnosis on imaging, CT, MRI, TE can suggest it as well. <clears throat> Sometimes they're spontaneously resorbed. Um, if you have a very large one, so over a centimeter thick in the ascending aorta, you start to treat it more like an aortic dissection that that per person is at a higher risk of perforation and dying. So you would talk to surgery about that and see if they need to uh, go to the OR. <clears throat> if you have a hematoma, because the dissection flap isn't going, propagating onward, normally if you see someone who comes in chest pain with mental status changes, you think of dissection because it could be the aortic dissection and it's dissecting up the carotid. So that would give you know, chest pain, mental status changes, stroke-like symptoms, think about aortic dissection. In hematoma, that's less likely. You have a thickened wall, it's not propagating on like a dissection flap does. So that's why pulse deficits would be less likely. And it doesn't really affect the aortic annulus either, so you're not going to have the aortic regurgitation, which can happen with acute uh, aortic dissection. So some of them can develop a dissection to have a hematoma, and some of them can actually get aneurysm afterwards. But again, just it's more to raise awareness that it exists. You know, when you see someone call that on a CT, what does it mean? You know, talk to vascular surgery or cardiology about treatment as well. So the penetrating aortic uh, ulcer is something that, again, with imaging advances, we started to recognize more often. And it may be just an erosion of a plaque into the wall. But as you can see here, I mean, this is a very large one. This is on a TE. You see this narrow neck and this large thing? This, this obviously could rupture. This could be a real problem. So ones that are really large, so if it's greater than two centimeters across or more than a centimeter down, those ha are associated with worse outcomes. So small ones, we could just watch. It may be a ruptured plaque, maybe it'll heal over. But very large ones, especially if someone's symptomatic, it's worth asking vascular surgery, does this need to be repaired or not? People have symptoms, that's obviously telling you something has changed, something is wrong, and it could be getting worse, and you want to obviously catch it before it ruptures, because then you're in big trouble, you only have minutes at that time. So there are different types uh, of ulcers and you know you obviously can rupture through that and that's what we're trying to avoid. So what about chronic aneurysms? Well they can acutely expand. Um, it's unclear why someone would all of a sudden get to a certain level. You know from Laplace's law that the, the wall tension is a function of the radius. So as the wall gets, as the diameter or the radius is growing, the tension on the wall grows, there may be a critical mass there where they start to have symptoms or it ruptures. But certainly if someone already has an underlying thoracic aortic aneurysm, whether it's descend ascending or descending, that's large. If they now have chest pain, you can't explain. That would be an indication for surgery. So there's a couple ways you could do this. Um, thinking about risk factors. I mean, there's all these risk scores and things, and I can just tell you, there, this one is a, um, a risk marker. What they did was they took symptoms and risk factors, and they try to come up with a score model for you. A lot of times, you know, you can have apps on your phone and do all these things, but getting it in your brain of what, what, what should I be worried about, what symptoms should trigger me getting worried is a lot easier. But just to give you an idea of this, what they do is they call these um, risk categories and they give you a score for them. So obviously if you have risk, risk such as Marfan syndrome or everyone in your family has an aneurysm or you have bicuspid aortic valve or you just had a cardiac cath, this would give you a point. The um, 
This is the symptoms here. So it was an abrupt onset of pain. This is a really important take home point. So in angina, if someone's even having an MI, you know, sometimes they'll go whoop and go over, that's an arrhythmia. But a lot of times what happens is they'll notice it comes out and they're like, it just really started burning, it really started getting tight, and then it was whatever. It sort of warms up and then goes to peak intensity. Aortic dissection classic is like, boom. They say, I was walking, boom. I just went down, I was in so much pain. They even can have syncope. Um, that, they can tell you exactly the moment that it happened. That's more classic for aortic dissection. So someone with risk factor for that sort of abrupt uh, onset of pain is really important. Also the uh, severity of the pain. One thing is it goes to peak intensity immediately. It doesn't warm up like a crescendo. It's boom. It's 10 out of 10 right off the bat. Now one thing that can fool you is over time the pain can go away. So it's you know just because someone's in the ER and now they look better but something brought them in you have to really still think about it and this is really your own clinical acumen. Um, if you look at symptoms, and those are the symptoms, and then you know, obviously ripping or tearing pain, reading to the back. You know, if you have chest pain, it's more likely a proximal one. If it's down your back, obviously a type B. Um, and then in terms of the physical signs, pulse deficit or blood pressure differential gives you a point. If you have a focal neurologic deficit along with your pain. Aortic insufficiency, what's ironic in morning report when someone talks about it, they'll say, oh yeah, and there was a short diastolic murmur. Usually in the acute phase, it's really hard to hear because the ventricle hasn't compensated. You don't have that wide pulse pressure and the sound. Is, so it's there on the echo, but it's actually hard to hear uh, normally in the acute setting unless it's very obvious. Um, shock obviously would give you some points too. So you guys obviously probably often, if you were thinking about the section, you'll say, okay, was there a pulse differential? How often do people with aortic dissection have a pulse differential? Anybody? So from the IRED registry, we know that in that registry, at least that was 2000, we have an updated version now, that if only about 15% of people have a differential in their brachial arteries, pulse pressures or blood pressure. So if you say, well, they don't have a dissection, their pulses are equal, you only miss 85% of the people. So that's pretty good. Just kidding, that's not good. So looking at different features that are most common, so pain, incredibly common. That's the most common symptom. Chest pain. It can be in the back, it can be in the chest, depends on where it is. But if you look at it, I highlighted pain is important, severe pain important, and then sudden onset. This is really important. This is typical classic dissection. And like I said, some people have syncope. I mean it brings them to their knees. So if you want to look up the risk factors and how many markers you know, this, this is fancy and it makes a nice publication, but the bottom line is if you have a risk factor or two and any symptoms, you're already getting into where most of the patients, half of the patients, only had two risk markers or three. So the majority are one, two, or three. You don't have to have Marfan's anti-bicuspid valve and ripping, tearing, 10 out of 10 pain with a pulse deficit. You know, just, you, this is one of these that has to be an index, a high index of suspicion. Uh, think about it, and the patient obviously if they have Marfan syndrome or they've had their aortic root replaced or something else, and they have these symptoms and sudden onset severe pain, think about it. Certainly they could be ill appearing. Again, aortic regurg is not that obvious. Um, hypertension is very common, especially in type B, unless they're already in shock because they're leaking somewhere else. Um, so pulse deficit, again, it's, a, it's an important prognostic marker. It tells you that the flap has already dissected down a subclavian, so it's gone a long way. It has prognostic significance, but it's not present in that many people. People can also rupture, especially if it's a proximal one, so they can even present with tamponade. And I told you, if someone comes in with an inferior STEMI, if that story was first, yeah, I had this sudden onset pain, and then I got this burden, you know, you wouldn't be surprised. Normally we're racing off to the cath lab and you figure it out in the cath lab when you can't get the catheter in the right corner of the and you shoot the aorta. Pleural fusions are possible too. There's always these confusing algorithms that make a lot of sense and then you forget them as soon as you turn the page. But it's what I told you. Do they have the right symptoms? Do they have the right risk factors? Are there any significant high risk features of their pain? And anything on their exam and then you move on. In terms of biomarkers, 
it's not exactly like troponin, thankfully, because we can't handle any more consults. But if you have a low D dimer, um, I'm working on that anti troponin antibody. It's not available yet. If you have a really low D dimer, it's, it goes against having a dissection. It's not perfect. But as you can see, that it, it's uh, very unlikely that you have any other dissection with a normal or low D dimer under 500. There are other things that you people have looked at. I don't know if you've ever ordered a calponin. I don't think we have it, so it's not going to be helpful. So anyway, there are things that people look at, but again, not helpful. Your clinical diagnostic reason is going to be more important here. Chest x-ray, it can be abnormal, but it doesn't really give you a whole lot. You know, is the mediastinum wide or not? It doesn't have to be. Um, in fact, in type A, 11% were negative. So one out of 10 had a pretty normal looking chest x-ray, even with a type A dissection. So that's not everything. The EKG can be abnormal, but they usually have, if they have hypertension, they may have an abnormal EKG. So it doesn't tell you everything. It's sort of like a pulmonary embolism. You see sinus tech. The EKG is unremarkable. This is, with the section especially, it's one of the ones I think of when someone has chest pain and they don't seem like all they want is dilaudid and they really had something bad happen. I think, okay, is this coronary? Is, and if, if the EKG looks pretty normal and the story doesn't fit, but something's really wrong with them, I think about pulmonary embolism. Is there S1, 2, 3, P3, right axis, right bundle, hypoxia? You know, do they have risk factors for that? And if that doesn't pan out, I'm thinking, could it be a dissection? Because if you look at someone and say, man, something, something's not right about them, think about dissection. Those three should be in your mind as life-threatening things, not to miss. Um, okay, I already told you about the uh, STEMIs that go down the right coronary because the dissection flap has gone down the right coronary. The main issue is if you can figure it out beforehand, it's helpful because if people have a big dissection, anticoagulation is not a great idea. It could lead to rupture. All right, here's a wide mediastinum. This one's really wide. Only seen in 63% of people who have a type A dissection. There's another one. That's a pretty obvious problem, unless someone's arm is in the way. That's a problem. Um, T uh, transthoracic echo, not very useful. Sometimes you can see a dissection though. Um, TEE is very sensitive and pretty specific. In general, you know, if someone has renal failure, it's not great because you have to mobilize people, sedate them. Um, but we also miss a little bit of the ascending aorta into the arch. So you don't get the whole thing if there's a focal dissection. So it's, it's not always the first line therapy or diagnostic test, which makes sense. Um, but if someone has a creatinine of four and they don't, they're not on dialysis yet, sometimes we end up doing that. It's just hard to mobilize everybody. CT is usually the fastest and easiest because you can do it right out of the ER. If someone's unstable, putting them in an MRI machine, and then when they code and everyone's trying to find where's MRI and all that, it's not as elegant either. So CT usually first. Think about TE or MRI if that doesn't work. This is a TE here. This image, this is looking at the aorta down, kind of looking right down on top of it. And you can actually see this flap sitting in the middle of the aorta that should not be there. These are the sinuses of Alsalva, and here's this flap. This is a problem. So a, a cardiac or just a regular CT has about 100% diagnostic accuracy. You can get it right off the emergency department, it's fast. And you can even see the branch vessels, if it's dissecting into the iliacs, if it's going off the SMA, or down into the subclavian, or the carotid. Usually, you know, we say, okay, they had a CT rule out PE. The one thing you should be aware of is if you really think it's a dissection, to tell them dissection, because they'll get more of the aorta. The other issue is with contrast. When you give contrast, and you're doing a CT, you want a time when you're going to take the images. So if you give the contrast, you want to, and it's for a PE, you want to get it when it's going through the right side of the heart into the pulmonary vessels, so you're going to image a little earlier, right after the bolus. If you want to do the aorta, you're going to wait a few more milliseconds until it circulates to the left side. And then it, then you're going to get it because you get a little bit better contrast from the iodinated contrast that way. So it is important. Often it's not subtle, and you can see a dissection flap. So if I'm not sure, I still say, go ahead with the CTPE or try to get a little bit longer images to see the aorta because you can see the dissection flap. But if you really are worried about dissection, tell them that because they will time the, the imaging a little bit different. Does that make sense about timing? Right side versus left. 
And here's just an example of this half moon. This is typically what you would see. And, and often there's enough contrast on the regular CT for a PE that you would still see this. So that's why I don't worry as much about it. It's just how far they're going to image. Here's another one. Here's the, uh, the true lumen, and here's a false lumen. You can see the flow is, is slower, and that's why the, the contrast the attenuate, it's a little bit attenuated compared to this. But there's the flap and the false lumen. This is a 3D reconstruction of that. MRI, again, is cumbersome. If someone's really sick, putting an MRI scanner in a small tube in the middle of nowhere is kind of dangerous. Um, so if they're unstable, we try not to do it. It can be done. You can also see the LV function, aortic regurgitation. Um, you can look also if the lumen is clotted. You know, and for intramural hematomas, this can be really helpful. Aortography used to be the standard. We don't usually do this unless you're already in the cath lab and you're worried about it. So it's, it's, in general, not the first-line therapy. We can do intravascular ultrasound in the cath lab and isolate where the entry point using Doppler. Uh, but usually, again, this is someone's already made it to the cath lab because they had an inferior STEMI and they realize in the cath lab it's because of an aortic dissection. So let's just walk down the path for dealing with an acute dissection. Obviously, you take your history. Do they have high-risk features and symptoms? You get your ECGs, you can look at a D-dimer, but again, don't think you, you shouldn't let that completely sway you. And then decide, are you going to do a, if you're worried about a CT, a TEE, or if that's not available, could they tolerate an MRI? Start medical therapy. So if, if the, and that would be really beta blockers and be first line agents here, nitride, anything, you got to get the blood pressure down. You don't use vasodilators in general, you don't want to increase your stress. So the question is, is the ascending aorta involved or not? If it is, call it surgery. If it's cardiac surgery, it's a problem. Um, these people, again, the mortality is going up by the, by the hour. Um, if they have a type B dissection, a lot of times we say, oh, we can handle it medically. But if they're not perfusing their gut, or they've taken out a different organ, or they're having renal failure because of it, or they're just having ongoing pain, it tells you there's an ongoing process. Um, that's somebody who may get surgery, or now we have this endovascular extension. And so that, there's a new trial that shows that this actually may be beneficial and looks like it is beneficial. So our goals in treating them, and this is where you know you and I would be, is to get the heart rate down, get the blood pressure down. We're trying to decrease the shear stress on the aorta so that it doesn't rupture. Um, if someone's hypotensive, you can give them volume. But in general, we're trying to keep the pressure really low. You know, you're shooting for a systolic blood pressure closer to 90. You know, with uh, beta blockers, nitride on board. You're just trying to get them to the OR, especially if it's a type A dissection. If you do see um, a tamponade type situation or a big pericardial effusion in this setting, you don't tap it. That's aortic pressure and we exsanguinate. Um, I saw there was someone who was 30 in bodybuilder taking steroids who did this, and that isometric exercise, is very, you know, that lifting heavy weight like that can lead to aortic extension, and we eventually dissected, and he ruptured into his pericardium and literally just fresh blood coming out. And we, the patient needs to go to the OR because we're, we're not going to be able to handle it. Even if you can transfuse it right back, which people are cell stable, just you can do it. Repeatedly, it just doesn't work. You gotta get into the oil. So again, try the beta blocker first, goal, heart rate, 60, get the blood pressure down. If that's not enough, nitride, the cardipine, the beta law. Now you're just starting to do whatever it takes to get the blood pressure down. You got the beta blocker on, you're decreasing shear stress on the wall, you got that heart rate down. Now just start adding agents. These are usually easiest because you can titrate them. Treating pain is important. The catecholamine is raising the pressure as well, so give them something. In the cocaine setting, obviously, anxiolytics are really important too. So Ativan can be helpful. So think about treating those as well. You guys know this, but metoprolol, you can use the betalol. Either any of these IVs work fine. We usually are using these. as well as a ton of fluid, but you could use that as well. So when do you go to surgery for these problems? The type A dissection. 
And also, if you have a type A intramural hematoma, again, if it was over a centimeter, or they still have symptoms, that's a person who's at risk of rupture or more complications. It's worth getting surgery on board. In the chronic setting, with type A, these are people who've had a dissection that maybe started over two weeks ago. If they still have an aneurysm, or they have Marfan syndrome, or it's continuing to increase, or it's affected the aortic valve severely, or ongoing symptoms, then you would repair it. Type B, occasionally you do have to operate or do a stent. Rupture is obvious. If it continues to expand, if you're having ongoing symptoms, or any malperfusion syndrome, then you would want to do something with that. And in the chronic setting, if the thoracic aorta is over six centimeter, or it continues to increase, or you have ongoing symptoms, <laughs> operate. So they sort of all follow along. Symptoms, signs, malperfusion, large aortas, etc. So this thoracic endovascular aortic repair, or T-bar, is something that has come along in the last few years. Um, but now, there, there actually, since I made this, there's been a trial that came out. Um, so it becomes to the point where we used to not even call vascular surgery for type B dissections, but now it's worth talking about. Um, and what they do is, if there's a entry point, you can just stent over it. And you notice they didn't stent the entire area that has a dissection, per se, but if you stent one part, it'll help thrombose the lumen. So you don't have to know how to deploy this, but there is a trial now that shows benefit of T-bar in, in selecting patients. So again, we used to say, oh, just medical therapy, medical therapy, unless they have some malperfusion syndrome or a big aneurysm. Um, but now it's worth getting vascular surgery involved, but the T-bar in general, uh, this one is a different study. There's an, another study that recently shows actually a benefit the other way uh, for, for intervening on the type B dissection. So right now the guidelines say if you have a complicated type B to do it, if it's traumatic, you, you, they survive. They, they transected their aorta, but they've survived somehow. They locked it off. That's another indication, a class one indication. You could potentially do it in those penetrating aortic ulcers. You know, they have that narrow neck. If they still have symptoms, they're not responding to therapy. That's another reason you can put a shorter stent over that as well. So overall, prognosis, type A dissection, only a 60% survival. Part of this is recognizing it early and getting them repaired. In hospital mortality, one out of four people don't make it out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Type B dissection has a much higher survival rate. I mean, we used to just treat them medically. Uh, but again, now we're, we're advancing the therapies with some of this T-bar as well. If, certainly people are older. If that lumen is only partially thrombosed, it suggests ongoing problems and complications. And then if, you, if you've taken out part of your gut or kidney or something else, that's a problem as well. If you still have an aneurysm, think about surgery. And people often will need a repeat. The, this, on, this is sort of an ongoing problem. It's not a one, one and done. You'll see people who come in who have had a type B dissection and come in and do it again. So sometimes they come back with this or they eventually need surgery. Even if they've had surgery, they come back and have a new problem. So in general, when we're seeing them, someone who's had a dissection in your follow-up, keep their blood pressure down, keep their heart rate low, make sure they're on beta blockers. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys knew this, it's a little bit unrelated to this talk, um, but sort of peripherally, with Marfan syndrome, it's a defect in fibrillin. It's not only beta blockers, but it looks like Losartan. Losartan has specific effects, I think it's on NF-kappa B, but in, in mice and now humans, but in the mice, you can look at their aortas under a microscope. Losartan makes their aortas look like wild type, that they don't get the elastic fragmentation. It's really amazing. There's a, a paper, I think it's in science, that looks at this. So often we'll have those patients on Losartan and a beta blocker. Um, but that's specific to Marfan syndrome. But otherwise, keep every, all of them on a beta blocker. A lot of them have underlying atherosclerotic disease, which is a nidus for getting these problems. So statin makes sense. And then we, you know, if they if they have this acutely, they're going to see a surgery too. But we'll do serial aortic imaging a month later, three months, six months, twelve months later, find this way. That heavy lifting, that severe isometric exercise, can also lead to more strain on the aorta. So we recommend not, you know, if their job consists of constantly heavy lifting, that's not a good job. 
this is the, the this is Ehlers Danlos and this is Marfan syndrome. So again, think about the risk factors: bicuspid aortic valve, Turner syndrome, pregnancy, the Marfan syndrome. Uh, Ehlers Danlos is really important, and then the other things that cause atherosclerosis are a problem. If someone just had a car accident, certainly look at carotid aorta. That's a big risk factor. Think about the symptoms: severe, acute onset. It could be tearing or tearing or not, but it goes to peak intensity immediately and it comes on suddenly. Okay, so those are key points to think about the section especially. Um, it's really important to recognize it early and get us involved or surgery involved, vascular surgery, cardiac surgery depending. And normal, the, the best way to look it up is or to evaluate it is with a CT scan. Um, if that's not available, think hard about is TE available or MRI if the patient looks fine and your, your risk of your suspicion is kind of low. Uh, then an MRI is fine. If they're really unstable, it may be a TE. If they're already in a unit, you can do it in the unit too, with sedation. Get the, if, it, if you do come across this, obviously get the heart rate and blood pressure down, get surgery involved. Um, for the type B dissections, often we're just going to go with medical therapy. Any of the complications, TVAR with vascular surgery is now something that is coming up and recommended especially if there are any of the complicated issues and that would be in type B dissection or even penetrating aortic ulcer or traumatic rupture. You're not going to see many of these traumatic ruptures, but penetrating ulcer sometimes you will find from the images. If on the imaging they say it's partially thrombosis, just recognize that's a, a risk factor for more complications get vascular surgery involved. And then not really as much for you guys, but for cardiology or vascular surgery, they're going to be following up with serial imaging for the next year for the patient who's already suffering one of these problems. I had, I think I had some images here. Let me just see. I had some cool images. It must be on my other uh, drive. Some of them that I, I can tell you. Um, it can be deceiving, you know. It's really important to take that history seriously. Uh, I'll just tell you a couple of stories. One of them was the prisoner I told you about who was here. Another one was a 48-year-old guy. This is why it's important to talk to the patient. This one really stood out. I was uh, an attending, and there was another attending with me, and we had two teams. And the fellow came up and was really irritated at the ER. He said, they, they want to admit this guy. It's so stupid. It's so obvious what the diagnosis is, even a med student knows what it is. And then he handed the EKG to the medical student next to him and says, what is it? And the med student said, acute pericarditis. And it did look like acute pericarditis on the EKG. And so the attending said, well, obviously, did you see the patient? No. Okay. Well, obviously, someone saw him. They thought he should come in. Why don't we just bring him in? We'll do an echo. He's fine. We'll send him home in the morning. So they bring him in. And his only risk factor was really uh, alcohol, but leading to hypertension. He's an alcoholic. And so I remember walking past the echo lab just randomly looking for somebody. And I look in a room and it caught my eye. I just see this huge aorta with a dissection flap. And he didn't have pericarditis because he had ruptured into his pericardium. You could see clot in his pericardium. He had this pericardial effusion. So he was in the OR about two hours later with a pH of seven. He made it. But the fellow was like, I just learned to really enjoy it. So it's important to talk to the patient. His symptoms were not acute pericarditis. He has an aortic dissection. So um, it, it's really going to help you. Again, thankfully, it's more rare. But it's one you have to think of when you think of life-threatening things with chest pain. At least from a vascular standpoint, they're going to be coronary, PE, aortic dissection, or rupturing aneurysm, or one of these intramural hematomas or penetrating aortic ulcers. Certainly, there are other things like Borhoff syndrome, but if someone's vomiting and Tears their esophagus, a little bit different situation. That's life threatening too. Don't get me wrong, anyone going into GI, I know you guys have important things to do. Um, any other, any questions about this stuff? That's a good question. It's a huge stent. Um, and I'm not sure, they usually will do it for stents, but in the setting of a dissection or rupture or potential rupture, you usually people hold off on any anticoagulation. I don't know the answer to that if in the long term. Normally when we implant anything, so I don't know specifically for TVOC, because I haven't taken care of any of the patients who've had it yet, at least not in the acute setting. 
normally anytime we implant anything, whether we put in a septal occluder, uh, even bioprosthetic aortic valves, we'll try to anticoagulate, at least use dual anticoagulant agents for a, a while. And when I say a while, it could be six weeks, it could be three months. The European guidelines say for bioprosthetic valves, even though they're not mechanical, like an aortic or in mitral, that even consider anticoagulation for three to six months. Because until it endothelializes, there's always, it's a foreign body, so there's always a risk of forming a clot on it. In the acute setting, there's usually been a tear and rupture, and so people are hesitant to anticoagulate. But I bet in that setting we do, whether it's aspirin or dual therapy, I'm not sure. I don't know if we have guidelines on it yet. The risk of thrombosing a stent in the aorta is very low just because it's huge. You know, your risk factors in the coronaries are how small is it, how many did you put in, are they in bifurcation?